Chapter Twenty of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: Father Barry's Story. Say, Father Barry, it's pretty hard to prove that there's a personal devil, isn't it? Such was the remark made by Rob Collins to Father Barry, an old and intimate friend of Rob's father, and now on a week's visit at Mister Collins' villa father barry was a priest fairly advanced in middle life and if appearances go for anything a genial whole-souled gentleman he was sitting on the portico facing the lake and watching the waters dancing in a golden and purple glow to the tender touch of the evening breeze at the question the priest smiled shifted his position in his chair and said that reminds me of a story before he could finish his sentence rob gave a whoop hey fellows he shouted father barry's going to tell us a story very close to the edge of the lake where the sloping lawn merged into the level beach the smaller boys were engaged in the exhilarating game of bombay while elmwood and winter stood chatting beside them when the word story smote their ears charlie pearson just in the act of clearing the pyramid of hats piled upon the patient back of dockery who happened to be down lost control of himself and alighted squarely upon dan's back in such wise that hats and boys came tumbling unceremoniously to the earth when the two arose they were alone for the others had already scampered up the grassy slope and were now grouping themselves not without much pushing and squeezing about his reverence before they had quite settled this question of precedence the two tumblers breathless and panting made their presence known by their elbows while father barry flattered no doubt by the effects of the magnetism that had gone out from him sat back in his chair and smiled it was a captivating smile and very patient is it a ghost story father queried harry archer it's better than that broke in rob it's a devil story go on go on oh father please a litany of entreaties was at once directed at his smiling reverence to begin with said father barry i never told this story to any one before he paused oh go on father cried the chorus in the second place there is not a single man on the face of the earth knows it except myself is it true asked willie hardy earnestly yes every word of it i've been aching to tell this story for years and yet up to last week i couldn't make up my mind to do so but now i think that it can be told safely and completely well some fifteen years ago i was ordained priest dear me i was a handsome fellow then father barry paused and there was a humorous twinkle in his eye you must have changed awfully since that time father observed rob demurely oh go on father put in dan dockery we don't care how handsome you were then you're as handsome now as you've any right to be well after being ordained i went home to spend a week with my parents and to say mass at the church i had attended as a boy i wasn't idle during that week i assure you on leaving my home i was to take the position assigned me by my bishop in a country parish in well no matter where it was in one of the eastern states and if i were to name it you western boys would know where it was anyhow oh ah came the derisive comment i was saying that i wasn't idle when you boys interrupted me with your sarcastic interjections you see i would have to hear confessions just as soon as i reached my parish and i was busy reviewing my moral theology moral theology echoed harry collins what's that it's a new patented bicycle snarled rob why can't you let father barry go on moral theology resumed the priest affably is a treatise on the way to hear confessions 
just as a lawyer must take a course of law before he can go into law court so a priest must take a course of moral so as to know how to deal with how to guide those who come to him as penitents and i can assure you my boys that it's a very serious matter so then i reviewed my moral carefully and then on the first friday morning in the month of august i took the train that was to bring me to my new field of labors i put my valise beside me on the seat as the train started off took out my breviary examined my pocket to make sure that my faculties were there most people carry their faculties in their heads observed rob who would risk his life to perpetrate a pun Shh! exclaimed harry and walter happily too tender in their years and development to relish the villainies of a play upon words when i spoke of my faculties pursued the unruffled narrator i did not refer to those which flow from the soul but from my bishop faculties my children is a term used in sacerdotal circles hoo hoo harry and james interpolated meaning the permission and right to hear confessions only the bishop may give faculties and without them a priest is only a mass priest hasn't every priest the power to hear confessions by virtue of his ordination queried john winter yes he has the power but not the exercise of it just as a man with a hundred dollars in the bank at interest has the ownership but not the use of the money but that's nothing to do with my story well as i was saying i made sure that i had my faculties then opening my breviary i said my little hours what began willie hardy oh say growled john winter i propose that we head off all this questioning rob let's you and me be a vigilance committee now the first fellow that interrupts father barry again will be run off the premises go on father mm huh growled harry and walter and willie who looked upon john's remarks as being too personal as i had nothing particular to do and besides as i wasn't quite at home with my breviary as yet i took a very long time finishing and when i closed my book and according to a little practice of mine said a short prayer for the dying sinners of the day and another short prayer for those little ones of god who are in imminent danger of falling into mortal sin for the first time that very day after all this i say i was over at least thirty miles of my seven hours journey and it was hard upon ten o'clock when i raised my eyes then from my breviary now i am coming to the story i saw a boy leaning against the door of the car with his eyes fixed upon me in the most wistful manner the one short glance i gave him served me to take in almost every detail of his appearance he was the handsomest boy i ever saw i am aware that i am addressing a crowd of mamma's darlings who think they're nothing if not handsome that's what said rob sure added winter and so they are yet all the same none of you come up to the boy whose eyes fifteen years ago were turned wistfully upon me he was as handsome a lad as i had ever seen he was about fifteen undersized for his years and looking much younger a shock of chestnut hair peeped out from under his fishing hat and served to accentuate the striking beauty of his features his eyes were full of expression and sweetness and innocence he was well proportioned and even in his rough outing dress one could see that in him health and goodness and beauty were all combined i said that his eyes were expressive sweet and innocent the expressiveness as i gazed upon him revealed trouble and sadness something had gone wrong with him i could see at once all this i say i took in at a glance that was all the time he gave me for as my eyes met his a look of displeasure came suddenly upon his face an expression of aversion from me and he turned sharply and opened the door leading out from the car hello i said in a tone that without arousing the attention of others would catch his ear 
he turned toward me again and paused with his hand upon the door his expressive face still telling me that i was an object of dislike to him come here my boy i said he paused irresolutely as though some struggle were going on within him then evidently with an effort released his clasp upon the door and took a step toward me and mark this my boys as he let go the door and took that step the look of aversion in his face disappeared as if by magic and in its place came such an expression of trustfulness that i could hardly believe my eyes indeed i rubbed them earnestly oh father he exclaimed holding out his hand to clasp mine and his voice was as sweet as his character thank god that you called me i was never in such trouble in my life and if i had gone away that time and i should have gone away had you not called me something awful might have happened sit down my boy i said and we'll have a talk i saw that you were in trouble and that's why i called you he took the seat beside me and said at once father i want to go to confession indeed i answered if you wait till we get to l dash i can hear you but not till then at present we are out of my diocese in the meantime my boy you can tell me your trouble well father it's the worst trouble of my life to begin with my name is ray sumner i am fifteen and have been going to a catholic boarding school in new york these last five years after the closing exercises of this present year myself and two college chums travelled off into the mountains for an outing we are just now on our way home where are your two friends i inquired they're in the next car in the smoker poor fellows two of the best boys father i ever met they stood high at college and were both in our blessed lady's sodality i've known them now for three years and never till to-day did i hear them say anything or see them do anything that was really bad of course they had their little faults but they were such good fellows well our outing passed most pleasantly we went hunting and boating and bathing and fishing to our heart's content the only thing we didn't like was the fact that there was no catholic church within thirty miles of us it was partly i should say chiefly on that account that we broke up camp yesterday morning you see father i was making the nine first fridays and to-day was to have been my ninth the other two finished theirs on the first friday of july we reached the village of s dash last night and went to the house of the parish priest but he had been called away that very afternoon on important business and was not expected back till saturday he was the only priest in s dash and so we had to put off our communion that spoils my nine fridays father i'll have to begin over again you mustn't take your disappointment too hard i said you can begin over as you say and besides you did everything in your power is this your trouble no sir it's far worse the trouble began on these cars we took this train at seven o'clock this morning and started off pretty cheerfully considering our disappointment everything went along nicely till about nine o'clock yes till a quarter past nine for i happened just then to look at my watch while i was putting it in my pocket a man stepped over to where we were sitting and said here youngsters you must be pretty dry we're going to have some fun in this smoker and you fellows have got to join in he held a bottle toward us now father there wasn't one of us that ever touched liquor we didn't care for it and we always held that it was not a nice thing for youngsters like ourselves to drink especially in public and still when that man held the bottle towards us i almost instinctively put out my hand to take it i don't know why there was something about the color of that liquor which seemed to to captivate me that's the only word i can think of that comes near expressing the feeling i had 
i drew back my hand almost as soon as i put it forward but i didn't have to explain my change of purpose for harry burton one of my friends reached over took the bottle and thanked the man who at once hurried away i was surprised at what harry had done and was still more surprised when he put the bottle to his lips and took a drink i could hardly believe my eyes when walter sherbet our companion took the flask eagerly and put it to his mouth and do you know father the strangest thing of all as it seemed to me was that i myself was tortured to take a share somehow nothing had ever seemed to me so inviting as that wretched bottle perhaps ray i said it was the force of example the expression which came upon ray's features showed me at once that i was mistaken it was a look of determination a look which convinced me that i was speaking with a boy of character no ray made answer it wasn't that i've been thrown among all sorts of boys father during my five years at boarding school and i learned pretty early that if a boy wants to be good he's got to live up to his own conscience of course i knew that it was no sin to take a drink if one could stand it though for a boy to touch strong liquor at all certainly looks bad but what frightened me was that i was so eager to drink and besides there was something that seemed to warn me ray that was your guardian angel i said for now i thought i saw the true meaning of my little friend's story father i think so myself now that the temptation is over my two chums tried to get me to drink and i was almost on the point of yielding they didn't know how near i was to giving up and they tried to force me one of them held me and the other put the bottle to my mouth and tried to pour the liquor down my throat ah i put in that settled it ray if i know you <laughs> exactly father that settled it i became bull-headed at once and much as i was fascinated by that bottle i wouldn't have touched it then for anything <laughs> sometimes it's good to be obstinate father you were firm ray they were obstinate well they got angry at me and swore and called me names which made my blood boil but i was too sorry for them to say anything it was awful to hear these dear friends of mine i had always thought to be next door to saints swearing and talking like street loafers i tried to get the bottle away from them and that made them drink the more oh it was the awfulest half-hour i ever spent my best friends were going to ruin right under my eyes father i, I loved those two boys as if they were my own brothers here my little friend's voice broke i was strongly moved myself for though i have roughly repeated his words i am utterly unable to give you any idea of the pathos which he put into his story he was as affectionate as he was firm and as firm as he was beautiful i hate to say it he went on but at the end of half an hour my two companions were entirely changed they were drunk and they talked like like devils he put his hands before his face and paused go on my dear boy i said encouragingly tell me all i feel quite sure that i can help you he gave me a glance of gratitude and continued i said father that they began to talk like devils well the smoker itself seemed to become like the bad place itself there were bottles in every direction and the cursing and blaspheming and vile singing were horrid it seems horrid now father but at the time i felt tempted to listen i felt tempted to take part i tried to pray but prayer had grown ugly and everything vile and villainous had grown beautiful it seemed to me that god wasn't near me and everything had become topsy-turvy 
i became frightened for i feared that i was about to yield and fall into mortal sin just then the fellow who had given us the flask broke into a song he had a magnificent voice and as he began every one grew silent and many crowded up to the further end of the car where he was standing leaning against the water-cooler with his hat tilted back and with a bottle in his hand his fine voice could be heard distinctly through the car but such a song it was vile and nasty and yet at the moment i would have given anything to listen to it if i dared but i knew that it was a question of keeping my soul white and i made up my mind to leave the car till it was over god bless you my boy i said for his way of speaking convinced me that he had escaped free from a general tragedy of souls my two friends just as soon as the song began crowded forward eagerly to hear it they left behind them that vile bottle here it is he drew from his bosom a pint flask which was nearly empty you can imagine boys the effect of so much liquor on lads who had never before touched it i took the bottle and threw it out of the open window porter i said to the attendant who was just passing our seat is the state-room of this car engaged he answered that it was not i secured it at once for half a day for i felt that i should have need of it well ray i resumed you may thank god sincerely that you have come off so well from this temptation it was an unusual a terrible one and to show you that i understand your case i am going to finish your story myself ray gazed at me in wonder when you left that vile smoker ray you came into this car at once your eyes lighted upon me and you felt an inclination to address me yes sir that was it exactly said ray on the other hand i continued you felt an impulse just in the other direction to get as far away from me as possible how in the world father did you know that and another thing the inclination to go away from me was stormy disturbing disquieting in a word just like the inclination you felt towards taking that drink father father cried ray you are reading my heart no my boy i answered but some centuries ago there was a saint named ignatius who wrote some rules to help us to tell the motions of the good and the motions of the bad spirit you have had a good angel quiet and gentle in his suggestions helping you against the prince of darkness but i haven't finished your story yet while you stood looking at me and hesitating i finished saying my office and said a prayer for you for me father yes my boy i said a little prayer for all the boys in the world who were that day to be tempted to commit mortal sin ray seized my hand while his eyes spoke intense gratitude then as i looked up and my eyes caught yours as soon as you saw my face you at once were seized with a strong dislike for me an unaccountable aversion and while you felt moved to come near me anyhow you were urged yet more violently to leave the car you yielded to this feeling and started to go out when you heard me calling you then the struggle was renewed and it was with the greatest difficulty that you made up your mind to come to me and to tell me your whole story but as soon as you arrived at this decision you felt like your old self am i not right yes father but how in the world can you know this as soon as you made up your mind your feelings of disgust for prayer the allurements of all this wrong-doing going on in the smoker vanished into thin air you felt no longer any dislike toward me in a word all your temptations and evil inclinations were gone ray gazed upon me as though i were a mind-reader 
i saw in that gaze that i had told his story aright at this point of father barry's story rob could contain himself no longer father barry he broke in excuse me for interrupting but i am like ray i can't for the life of me see how you could know all that without being told father barry smiled i knew the rest of his story rob by inference first of all it seemed clear to me that the strong and sudden inclination for drink which came upon these boys was neither natural nor acquired i reasoned that the devil was trying to put liquor into their mouths to addle if not to steal away their brains does the devil tempt people to drink asked harry let me answer your question indirectly my boy when i first went to the seminary i was a great smoker if any one asks what's a seminary said john winter in a stage whisper to the boys i'll shoot him but continued the priest i was obliged as a seminarian to lay aside my pipe and cigar it was a little hard at first but by degrees i became pretty well used to it one morning after six weeks in the seminary i woke up with a burning desire for a smoke during the mass my thoughts were wandering to the imaginary fumes of a havana during studies my fancy was tracing rings and clouds it seemed to me then that there was nothing in the world like a good smoke so engrossed was i by this longing that i could hardly apply myself to my books i felt thoroughly ashamed of myself but there was the longing it went to bed with me and got up with me in the morning it followed me it clung to me it haunted me the third day was the same the fourth day it was worse then i screwed up my courage and went to my spiritual director hoping in my heart that after the shame of telling my story he might let me smoke a cigar i told him my story he was a saintly old man of deep experience and when i had ended he said my dear brother what you tell me is a very good sign the devil when he is afraid to attack a man openly because he sees that the man is in horror of all sin attacks him in what he finds weakest your weak point the devil thinks is smoking he wants to worry you about smoking and then gradually lead you on to something worse but you have already inflicted on the devil the strongest blow he hates the light you have told on him then my boys i walked out of that room with no more longing for smoking than i had for the study of hebrew <laughs> now do you understand how i could infer the rest of ray's story oh exclaimed rob as soon as ray made up his mind to tell you his temptation the devil turned tail that's exactly what happened as i firmly believe answered father barry the prince of darkness doesn't like to have his plans brought to light and that's why he hates the confessional this is all very fine broke in willie hardy but let us hear the story all right willie well we were now travelling in my diocese and after a few words on my part and a short preparation on ray's i heard the boy's confession a general confession of his whole life in the stateroom which i had engaged now i don't want to shock you boys you know how binding on priests are the secrets of confession but i shall presently explain why i now say to you that this boy whose confession was the first i ever heard had never in his whole life committed a single mortal sin he had had his temptations trying ones too for he carried about him my friends this muddy vesture of decay but he had come off bravely and his greatest triumph 
the triumph of grace he had won on that very morning but a few minutes had elapsed after his confession and ray was still making a short thanksgiving for the grace of the sacrament when the door of the car opened and two boys both larger than ray and a year or two older staggered in their faces were flushed and they glanced eagerly about the car they looked angry and i at once inferred that they had come to settle with ray for making off with their flask ray i said show yourself at the door and call them here say nothing about me ray did as i had directed them the two advanced at once and staggering into our stateroom began to upbraid ray in very unbecoming language ray interrupted them boys he said there is a catholic priest here the two would have gone out but i barred their progress let me out said one i'll not stay here but you shall i answered neither of you boys shall leave this room till you are perfectly sober ray go out and call the porter ray made haste to obey me the two wore an ugly look i saw that they were determined to get out even should it be necessary for them to use violence but i was resolved to save these poor fellows if possible from further excess one of them had put his hand upon my shoulder with the intention of thrusting me aside when ray returned with the porter porter i said slipping a dollar into his hand i want these two young friends of mine to stay in here for a few hours till they're all right the porter gave me an intelligent nod see here you boys if either of you steps a foot out of this here compartment i'll get the conductor and the brakeman on your necks and the porter frowned horribly boys in general stand in awe of railroad officials and my two captives even in their present condition were no exceptions to the rule with very ugly words upon their lips they threw themselves upon one of the sofas and glared at me vindictively but the porter's aid did not cease here he came in presently with a plentiful supply of cold water and other restoratives and despite the growling of the prisoners he worked at them vigorously so that with my assistance and rays he soon had them on a fair way to complete recovery they ceased growling very shortly and the only signs of their dissipation were their inflamed faces and their stupid expressions what the porter gave them i don't know to this day whatever it was they were soon buried in a heavy sleep now sir remarked this sagacious negro if you lets them young gemmen sleep for about two hours they'll be just as good as new i replied with a fifty-cent piece and wished internally that i could spare more ray seemed to divine my wish for he came forward with an additional tip the smile the negro returned us was fully worth the money he told us to rely on him for anything we wanted and departed with his very best bow toward one o'clock walter sherbet awoke his first words were apologies to me for his conduct he tried to be pleasant but he was gloomy ill at ease and worst of all i could see that he held me in aversion at all events he was sober half an hour later harry opened his eyes and the same scene was repeated both of them i saw would be far happier could they escape my presence and now i made a bold move boys i said i want you to go to confession you should have seen their faces both protested that it was impossible out of the question and i never saw two boys more determined but i too was in earnest it was a fight for souls and as i believed i had the sacred heart on my side you know our lord has promised that priests who practice devotion to his heart shall have the power of moving the hardest sinners i had earnestly endeavored during my five years in the seminary to practice this devotion and now i counted upon seeing the promise fulfilled and sure enough after a long discussion how it came about seems miraculous 
i persuaded both boys to make their confession when they had finished they had no words to express their gratitude to me they said they didn't understand how it was that they had been so determined not to go to confession and they protested that while they were still heartily ashamed of themselves and sorry for their disgraceful behavior they were now very happy in short they became my warm friends promised to write to me secured my address and did everything within the inventive ingenuity of boys to show me their regard i explained to them my theory of their day's adventures and they readily agreed with me that the bad angel had been very active and in two cases out of the three very successful with them but clever as i thought myself my young friends i was blind i thought i saw everything i had seen only the fact i did not see the reason father barry paused but there was no smile on his face what was it you didn't see father we'll come to that rob well when we reached my station i got off accompanied by as hearty farewells as ever followed a traveller i see them yet these three bright happy boys standing upon the platform and waving their hats as long as i could follow them with my eyes then trusting that they would not forget to thank our blessed mother whose sodalists they were for their deliverance i walked up the main street and entered my church i poured forth an ardent prayer of thanks for these three confessions the first fruits of my ministry i was still engaged in prayer when i heard a great clamour without i raised my head and listened from out of the din i distinguished calls and various voices for a priest rushing up to the tabernacle i drew out the key from my pocket and opening the door hastily took several consecrated hosts from the ciborium and placed them in my picks i was tying up the burse when a man threw open the doors of the church what's the matter i said i am a priest there was now a sea of faces at the door and i could hear the hearty thank gods that broke from the honest lips of their owners then the man spoke and as he spoke the blood in my body seemed to turn to ice boys do you know what had happened the train i had just left had broken through a bridge four miles further up the track and the engine and cars had been dashed down fully fifty feet my head was buzzing and i was leaning for support against the altar before the man had finished his announcement but in a moment i recovered myself and made for the door a number of men came crowding about me each one urging me to take his horse i jumped upon the nearest and accompanied by the man who had given me news of the accident dashed away at full speed it was a time of agonizing suspense for me and fast though we went hours seemed to be passing at last we were there and as i made my way in among dead and dying i gave general absolution to all father said an irishman taking off his hat as he addressed me there is a boy here who is begging so earnestly to go to communion i followed him past faces that were set in death among them i saw my poor friends walter and harry they had died instantly here he is father said the irishman i gazed down upon that sweet placid face the face of ray the eyes that met mine were shining with joy of welcome looking upon his features one would not know that the boy's last hour had come there was little time to spare bending beside him i asked him to make an act of contrition that i might once more give him absolution i am ready father he said reaching his hands toward me i made another act of contrition just before you came what day is it father friday i answered oh thank god thank god he exclaimed clasping his hands i am going to make my nine first fridays after all the devotion that lighted up his face as i gave him the blessed sacrament 
was touching in the extreme and with the memory of that sweet look of purity accompanying me like the benediction of an angel i hurried away to attend to others for half an hour my attention was wholly engrossed with the dread work of preparing men of all sorts and conditions to meet their god then i returned to ray's side the doctor had informed me that his death was imminent the casualty which had wrecked so many lives was as people then thought a mere accident it was only last week that i learned that it was a crime it all came of the rivalry of two bridge builders mark this boys at nine o'clock of that very morning two men a bridge builder and his accomplice had hit upon a plan for ruining the bridge a plan that defied detection and while these two were taking measures that would ruin the bodies of many men the devil who knew their nefarious scheme was working with a last desperate effort to ruin their souls now you see how blind i was i had perceived clearly that the devil was working might and main upon that train but it had never occurred to me that there was some particular reason for his putting forth all his power of malice on again reaching ray's side the first thing i did was to ask permission to make use should i deem proper of anything he had told me whether in confession or not he gave it very willingly his face had grown wan and his breathing was heavy but he was brave and noble and joyous to the last not without effort he told me how he and his two friends seated in the state-room i had engaged for them had begun to gather the saying of the beads how he had been moved and edified by the great and unusual devotion which marked the demeanour of harry and walter how at the end of the third decade as the two said the sweet words pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen there had come a great crash and then a blank after this recital ray paused for a moment a change came over his face and i judged that the supreme moment was at hand i gave him my crucifix which he pressed tenderly to his lips and held there for quite a long time then suddenly his face lighted up with a supreme joy father father he gasped i have kept it white with a strange loveliness upon his features he murmured the sacred name and still radiantly beautiful as though his last heart-throb had been one of exquisite bliss his face became fixed in that last tender expression of exultant love oh thank god thank god he had kept it white i knew his meaning he was speaking my boys of his robe of baptismal innocence then father barry arose and looking neither to right nor left but holding his face as though he were gazing upon some vision of that other world he walked into the house it was full ten minutes before the boys discovered that they were talking in whispers then they became silent and upon the evening breeze came to the ears the strains from a boat crew of seminarians upon the lake as they chanted the ave maristella to the queen who knows so well how to guard the purity of her young and loving clients End of chapter twenty